All right, so today we're going to talk about a case that I think is going to be very useful for our friends out there with dysautonomia. So the primary complaints are shortness of breath, obviously tachycardia, sense of dizziness and lightheadedness, significant GI upset, brain fog, and all of the symptoms that we normally see that are relative to hypoperfusion, right? So my name is Dr. Nathan Kaiser here at the Kaiser Clinic in Chelsea, Michigan, and we help people with neurological dysfunction, and we help them figure out what's going on so we can help them create a solution and get better. We've had a lot of great cases lately. Sorry, I haven't been able to share them, but this is one that's fresh on my mind from yesterday. And I think it's really important because it shows just how beautiful this machine is that we have that is a human brain and where the opportunities are to be able to use it to get our way out of these symptoms. So the thing that I found incredibly useful was that looking at this case, we see some interesting features just in the history. So it's, it's a case that's not fully a year old, which is good. So by a lot of people's standards, it's finding us pretty quickly. It's all of these symptoms we just described that are punctuated with these episodes of severe dehydration, having to go to the hospital, significant tachycardia, significant short of breath, almost um, borderline kind of like panic attack type symptoms. And, and because of that, when you go to the ER, and you look like you're in that state, it's very easy to uh, get a diagnosis of anxiety and then be, be sent on the way. Um, but some of the curious things that I think are important that you can probably relate to are increases in tachycardia and shortness of breath, particularly around eating, particularly with larger meals. And I think these things are really, really interesting also uh, had an onset at an event where began to have a tremoring. We've talked about tremoring in the past. If you've missed those videos, you can go back and take a look at them. But what's unique about tremors is when we see sort of these like anxiety tremors or like hyperventilation type tremors, those are one thing, but these ones actually started on one side of the body in the, in the right leg and progressed from there. And that's very interesting for me um, when I hear that as a history. And then same thing, we're having uh, events relative to graviceptive challenges, like flying in an airplane. Those are big and useful. So kind of without giving away too much um, and thinking about, about those features, what I wanted to share was, was really interesting when we look at these hypoperfusion symptoms relative to blood flow design. So I'm gonna throw this up here. And I know that this is kind of like looking at an eye chart and it's a little bit hard to read. So I apologize for that, but it's hard to get it all on one screen. What we're showing, if you're looking at this graph, you can see over here, we're looking at basically blood flow that's going into the middle cerebral arteries of the brain. So we've got the carotid vessels in your neck. You got the common carotid, which goes into the internal carotid. And that becomes the middle cerebral artery, which becomes kind of the main trunk of supply into the brain. So it becomes a really good proxy for us to understand just simple blood flow in the brain. Now, when we look at these top numbers, we want to see, now obviously this one says zero, that's because we lost the signal. Sometimes when we have a nice signal here, remember this thing is kind of locked on their head, they're not moving. And when they elevate on a tilt test, sometimes we'll lose that signal just relative to the strength of the signal that's going um, with the blood supply. So that's what we're seeing here. And we want these numbers to stay above 90. This one dropped to 78. And then beyond that, in the next columns coming down, we want them to all stay above 85. You can see we drop as low as, you know, 54.7, 72.6, you know, 60, 72, 56. Um, we get back to 83 with dual tasking. Again, it drops. So it never really stays, it never really stays kind of in that range that we want it to stay in. And one of the things that we see is particularly with this left rotation. So we have them, the, the curiosity here, when someone looks like this and they develop a tachycardia, but as you can see, let me drop back here, this mean arterial pressure stays stable. So you actually actually see to a degree the mean arterial pressure hovers around the baseline but actually comes up a little bit which means blood pressure in the body as would be measured by blood pressure cuffs is actually doing pretty well uh, it actually goes up so we see a blood pressure that's going up we see a heart rate that's going up we see perfusion in the brain that's going down so what could that mean and that's an important question for us because um, this person uh, is, is on the typical medications that we would see not for this test but typically um, using things like propanolol and corlin or, or of Aberdeen. And we know that these are, are designed toward slowing the heart rate down so that it can feel better and have a better pressure of blood that's moving per heartbeat. Uh, obviously, this test is not done with those medications, but that's what's traditionally being used to try to solve for this. But if we step back for a second, take a breath and think about, okay, blood pressure is going up, heart rate's going up. Why would blood flow in the brain be going down. So this is where we start to look at, do we have something that is an impediment to blood flow? Meaning we're blocking the river, so to speak. We're damming the river. So if we're having a hard time actually creating blood flow into the head, something's blocking it. That's a situation where my brain can be screaming for more blood. Receptors in my neck might be saying like, we're doing great, tons of pressure here. 
and we see this mismatch. So what we can look at in that case is we look at these. So these are studies from the Doppler. We had this patient come and sit up. And when they sit up, you can see in the seated position, this is the left MCA versus the right. You can see there's a difference here, but it, there's a stable kind of waveform on both sides. It's flat. So when you look across there, it looks like flat ground. But when we have this person rotate their head to the right, so it's just simply doing this. We see on the left side over here, right at this mark, so this is right, you can see right where, right where that head turn happens, you can see the amount of blood flow drops pretty significantly. So we go from 43 centimeters per second to 29 centimeters per second, which is a significant drop. And we can see that happen right there based on a head turn. And then we move back into a normal kind of resting position after that. So you can see um, this is in time, right? So, so you can see a gap in time here where right there is where we were head turn and then when we turn back to the middle that number goes back up which is really really important and then if we slide this thing up a little bit when we turn head to the left you can see on the other side here now this one cuts down okay and then when we go back to the middle we see an elevation in that heart rate again right back to normal or excuse me in the in the cerebral blood perfusion right back to normal so this is really helpful for us because we're seeing that problem we're experiencing on a tilt test as this functionality that's relative to the neck now normally when you turn the head side to side, there may be slight changes in blood flow, but it shouldn't be significant ones. And we, we see this is true when we look at tests where patients um, are put in uh, like head down, head turned procedures, like surgical procedures for a long period of time. We see the same thing happen and they're more likely to have injuries from hypoperfusion to the brain when we do these surgeries. So if we, and we can translate that and understanding that here, where if someone's just hanging out, but their head is turned, or in this case, we didn't look at it because I couldn't fit it all on, on one page, but also in flexion, we kind of cut them as well. And the left one is more significantly impaired consistently than the right. So in flexion and in right rotation, they're both impairing this left-sided blood flow. And so we go back to our history and we think about some of the things that we're describing. Um, we see that we have tremors in the right leg. In our exam, we found that there was an otolithic imbalance that was happening relative to perceptions that would happen uh, in, that, in that cortex at a higher rate. I know that's a little bit complicated, but we see this um, change in processing capacity on both sides, but then it skews toward the left, which helps us understand this better. So what does all this mean? It means that in this case, you might also find that some of these things speak to you, meaning we have this elevation of heart rate, we have an elevation of blood pressure relative to laying down, but we're not getting blood flow to the head. So we have to start answering questions around what would be impeding it. In this case, we're getting something that is creating a mechanical obstruction in the neck above the level of the bearer receptor. Now that doesn't mean that's what's happening in every case, but it's super important. And I think it's often overlooked. And if we're using a chemistry or medication to try to solve for this problem, we can try to increase the pressure to blow through that occlusion, but it's not as likely to be successful, especially in the face of something that when we think about a mechanical obstruction is not a wildly challenging thing to try to correct for just using kind of simple natural methods. So I get excited about cases like these because I know there's a super high upside for these patients and that just thrills me to no end. So I wanted to share it with you so that maybe you could put this in the basket of things that you might think about in terms of how do we solve problems like this. And so whether you're a doctor or whether you're a patient, you may find that just thinking about it slightly differently might open up your world into a different set of solutions. So I hope that helps. Please, 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 if this is useful, share it with other people. We have a very small niche of, niche of people that we look to serve and to help and to try to help them think about things differently. But if you know people in that niche and you think this is helpful, send it over. It might change a life. So thanks for that. Thanks for doing that service for us and for others. And uh, thanks for watching. Take care.